Good morning, good morning. Come in and get warm. Grateful for the, that the heat's working today. God bless you. Welcome. We're so excited that you're here with us this morning. My name is Mark Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at Royal Redeemer. Big uh, morning of celebration. We'll gather around God's word. We'll enjoy the holy meal, the bread and wine, the body and blood of Jesus later in the hour. And the school kids will be singing for us today. So lots of fun. Great blessing this morning. Would you stand? Let's start by standing. And let's make our beginning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we sing about this God who is our firm foundation. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? You are You are And I've still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense And I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my Jesus, he's never let me down, he's faithful in every season, so why would he fail? You won't, you won't, you won't.
great news for us this morning. Why don't you have a seat? I'll invite the uh, students to take their place. And let me kind of introduce our theme for today. Most theologians would agree that a core book of the Bible for theology and doctrine is the book of Romans in the New Testament. This is a letter written by St. Paul to the believers in Rome. Um, and if you had to pick a chapter out of Romans to really center on, you might choose chapter 8. So for the next couple of weeks, we'll be in a sermon series on Romans 8 called Life in Christ. And today, Pastor Zardi will be preaching on freedom in Christ. And let me share a couple of verses with you uh, to kind of set the tone for where we're going this morning. And I have to tell you, without exaggeration or hyperbole, the first sentence I'm going to read from Romans 8 is the best sentence you've ever heard. It's better than the Browns winning the Super Bowl. Better than your guy or gal winning the presidency. This is the best sentence you've ever heard, Romans 8. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That means for those of us who are sinners, and that's me and you, we're not responsible for our sin anymore. There's no, we're not condemned of our sin. And then it goes on, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So there's a lot there, right, in those four, four sentences. Pastor Zardi will unpack those uh, this morning. Uh, but before we go further, let's come together in prayer. Lord, we rejoice in this truth that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We don't face an eternal judgment that could be awful because Jesus instead took our punishment for us. So we rejoice in that this morning. Lord, thank you that the school children are here this morning. It's Lutheran Schools Week. They'll sing for us. They'll praise your name. You'll hear and, and um, you'll uh, receive with great joy um, the voice uh, of these children. Bless them as they sing. Bless our, our gathering this morning. Bless your servant, Pastor Zardi, as he preaches later. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, and together we say amen. Would you welcome Mrs. Torreson, please? Give her a round of applause. So we are singing the old classic hymn, Amazing Grace. In class, we talked about how it is so hard to hear that we are wretches, and that's what we sing in this song itself. It's hard to hear that we are sinful, but we know that there is amazing grace and that Jesus has come to cover all of our sinfulness with his blood. So this is Amazing Grace.
so, we will invite the choir to exit through the music doors right to my left. But if you're a Redeemer kid, you stand up too right now. Redeemer kids, you will go through those double doors. I see Mrs. LaBob waving at you. So, Redeemer kids, up on your feet, head toward Mrs. LaBob. Choir singers, you will go through the music doors. So we sang a song in the beginning about this firm foundation, this God that we have who's um, our redemption. And um, I read to you from uh, Romans 8, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the children just sang, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, who saved a wretch like me. So what God asks of us is to agree with that, to agree with the truth that we are sinners. And we call that confession. That's a Latin word, homo legeo, same speak. We are speaking the same as God when we confess. So it's less of a kind of a police interrogation confession and more of agreement with God when we in the church use the word confession. So I want you to spend just a moment now before God quietly confessing. However that is for you, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need your help. Or maybe specific sins that you're kind of calling out and confessing to God. But be with him in this holy moment and confess your sins to God. In the New Testament book of John, in the 20th chapter, Jesus tells his disciples, when you forgive sins on earth, they'll be forgiven in heaven. Not because I've got some magic, but because Christ is here and what he has done for you is with you now. So your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And together in bro as brothers and sisters in Christ, we make another confession, another agreement with God on what is truth. And we use creed. So would you stand? We'll confess the Apostles' Creed. We confess it from the words on the screen. We do it robustly and loudly with real conviction. Confess these words with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you take a few minutes and greet people around you, give high fives and hugs and hellos, welcome them to worship today. As you're finding your way back to your seats, welcome once again. Let me cover a couple announcements that we wanted to share with you. Of course, in the seat back in front of you, you'll find a couple of cards. The first is a connection card. If every household could fill one of those out, just so that we knew you were here today and we can be efficient in ministry, that'll go in the offering plate later in the service. The other card is kind of red in theme. It's our prayer card. We're a praying congregation. How can we pray for you? How can we pray with you? Let us know by using those prayer cards. And again, those will go in the offering plate later too. If you're visiting with us, you're very welcome here uh, we see you, and we might not know your name yet, but we want to learn it, and we want to learn your story and love you and walk alongside you on life's journey with Jesus. 
Uh, you're very welcome here and loved. We have a welcome bag for you. They're white. They're kind of to that, uh, on that uh, welcome counter to your left on your way out. Please take one to, uh, to be reminded that you're loved here at Royal Redeemer. We do have prayer ministers after our service to your left up here after the service to pray with you and pray over you. It would be a real privilege for them to pray with you, so please take advantage of that. And hey, we wanted to share some good news about our efforts to support Christian education through what we've been talking about over the last couple of months, the Lutheran Scholarship Granting Organization. So watch this uh, video from Pastor Zardi. Hello, my name is John Zardi, and I'm the senior pastor here at Royal Redeemer with just a quick update about the Lutheran Scholarship Granting Organization of Ohio, or LSGO. First of all, thank you for supporting Royal Redeemer Lutheran School and making use of the opportunity to convert your state tax dollars into scholarship dollars by giving to the LSGO. As a point of reference, last year there were 17,000 LSGO dollars available and awarded. This year, over $50,000 have already been raised. Dollars that can help support families and their ability to access a Lutheran education right here at Royal Redeemer. Now, for those of you who haven't participated yet, the good news is that donations can still be made up until April 14th for your 2023 state tax filing. However, it would be wise to make your contribution no later than March 31st, as you will need to include the LSGO payment receipt with your tax return. Above all, don't forget that this doesn't cost you a thing. It's simply a way for you to take the tax dollars that you'd normally pay to the state of Ohio and instead direct those dollars to help provide students with a Christian education here at Royal Redeemer Lutheran School. I mean, isn't that amazing? But that's not all. Even if you've already had your taxes withheld, you can still participate. If you want to learn how, or if you have questions about calculating your donations so that you can qualify for this dollar-for-dollar dollar Ohio tax credit, please pick up the information available outside the worship area, or just give us a call here at Royal Redeemer. We will help you in whatever way we can. Thank you again for taking part in this incredible opportunity. And thanks be to God for providing not only for the ministry that happens here day after day, but also for providing us with each and every one of you, God's people through whom he works in wonderful and powerful ways. A few more announcements to share with you before we uh, get into God's word. The Royal Redeemer, uh, we're having a Chipotle fundraiser. Who doesn't like a burrito the size of a Sunday paper? Uh, I love Chipotle, so tomorrow, 4 to 8 p.m., lots of details here I know, but tomorrow, 4 to 8 p.m., at the Royalton Road location in Strongsville across from the Cleveland Clinic, when you mention Royal Redeemer and do that up front before you order, uh, when you place your order, some of, that, uh, some of that money will come back to our school. Uh, we also have the school's annual PTO spaghetti dinner this Friday. Enjoy fellowship and a delicious meal. Grab flyers on your way out for both the Chipotle night and ordering information for the spaghetti night. I think they're on that center table as you leave on your way out. Uh, the baby bottles uh, and item donations for the Cleveland Pregnancy Center are due back next Sunday, so thank you for everyone who's picked those up. Some of you have returned them already. Thank you, that's okay. But they are due next week as we support life and the Cleveland uh, Pregnancy Center. And for all the information about stuff that I didn't have time to cover, all the usual places, our website, Pastor Zardi's letter, and all our usual uh, ways of communication. So as Pastor Mark pointed out, today we are starting a, a series called Life in Christ, and it is going to be based on the New Testament book of Romans, written by the Apostle Paul, and we're going to look in particular at chapter 8. And we're going to look at that chapter because Paul identifies ways by which God can change you uh, and, and how you feel about yourself. 
And that can be important because how you feel about yourself can impact how you live as a child of God. For example, if you have made a bad choice and you feel overpowered by guilt, you might feel worthless. Well, in Romans 8, Paul talks about how God can change that by giving you freedom in Christ. But maybe that's not it. Maybe you're not racked with guilt. But maybe there is a pattern of sinful behavior that's dominating your life, and so you feel powerless. Well, next week, we're going to look at Romans 8 and how God can change that by giving you victory in Christ. But maybe that's not it either. Maybe you're dealing with stress and worry and you feel like life is out of control. In week three, we're going to look at how God can change that by giving you hope in Christ. But maybe it's none of those things. Maybe life just seems kind of bleak and dark for you and you feel discouraged and maybe uncertain. And if that's the case, then just understand that in week four, we're going to look at Romans 8 and how God underscores the truth that you, can ha you are secure in Christ. Now, I realize that there are many areas of life that can impact how you feel about yourself. But over these next four weeks, we're going to look at Romans 8, and we're going to look at those, far, those four areas in particular when you're feeling you know, worthless or powerless or out of control. And we're going to look at how God can impact you in a positive way, how, uh, how God can address those situations for you. And, and so really the goal of this series is to uh, get you to not only stand, understand who God is, but what he has done and will do so as to um, offer you a healthy, productive, uh, that can provide healthy and productive change in your life, as well as uh, a new and, and far better life in Christ. Okay, so... Today, I'm going to start by looking at those first four verses that Pastor Mark just read a moment ago, first four verses of Romans 8, and, and we're going to look at those times when maybe you failed, maybe you made a mistake, maybe you made a really poor choice in life, and you are overpowered with guilt, and you're beating yourself up saying, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm no good, I'm, I, I, I am worthless. And while it's true that all of us make mistakes, right? We do. It happens. And sometimes we go, oh, knucklehead, what are you doing? I'm talking about those situations where those feelings linger and where those feelings of guilt become toxic and destructive, where those feelings last for weeks or months, believe it or not, even years, now, unfortunately, there are people who try to deal with those feelings on their own. They just try to ignore those feelings and hope they'll go away. That doesn't work. Other people, they just wallow in those feelings. And they say, well, if I am no good, I might as well feel like I'm no good. And that's not helpful either. So for all of you here, for all of you watching online right now, what I want to do is take a look at those times when you have done something wrong, okay, and you've, you have a bad choice or whatever, and you're beating yourself, you're in this perpetual state of just pounding on yourself, you know, making yourself feel absolutely worthless, you're overpowered by guilt. I'm going to look at those first four verses of Romans 8 and show you how you can be freed from those feelings, those toxic, destructive feelings, how you can experience freedom in Christ. So let's jump right in. In verse 1, Paul gives this incredible promise. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So Paul is basically saying that when you fail or make a mistake and you're beating yourself up incessantly, you just keep pounding away at yourself. If you want to break out of that, the first thing you want to do is hear God's promise. Okay, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You want to hear that promise, you want to take it in, you want to comprehend that promise, and you want to believe that it's true for you. Because when you believe that it's true for you, guess what? You start to see yourself in a different light. You start to see yourself the way God sees you. And, 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 and that's important because, of course, all of us are going to continue to make mistakes. Maybe you're not feeling guilty right now, but there might be a time when you make a bad choice or where you struggle with sin, and you just need to be reminded of the fact that because of what Jesus has done for you on the cross, God sees you in a different light. 
And that's the good news of Romans 8, verse 1. That promise that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That promise is good news, first of all, because it means that God is not angry with you. You do not have a target on your back where God is looking to carry out his wrath and punishment. You know why? Because he already took out all of his wrath and punishment when Jesus died on the cross in your place. So understand, God is not angry with you. He understands that you struggle. He wants to help you. Look at this. In Psalm 103, it says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He knows or remembers that we are but dust. God knows that you're human. He gets it. If a shepherd loses a sheep or the sheep wanders away and gets lost and falls into a ravine, and then the shepherd finds that sheep, pulls it up out of the ravine, he's not going to then kick it and beat it because it wandered away. And yet that's exactly how people think God is going to treat them if they wander away and fall into sin. He's going to pound on them and strike them dead and strike them down. And it's like, yeah, no, God is not like that. So understand, just do this for me. Do this favor for me. When, when you make a mistake, if you make a bad choice in life and you're feeling guilty, and do this for me. Instead of looking for God's lightning bolt of anger, look for God's open arms of love. Because honestly, that's what you're going to find. I mean, seriously, never forget that. Never. Because if you live always afraid of God, you're going to avoid God, aren't you? I mean, honestly, how many of you want to be around somebody who's mad at you? Yeah, me neither. Don't think that way about God. He's not angry at you. There is now no condemnation. And the first good news is God is not angry with you. Second reason why that promise is good news is because it means that God does not punish you. Now, to be sure, God can and will correct you and discipline you just like any wise and loving parent will correct and discipline their child to make sure they're doing the right thing and to keep them safe. But God does not punish you. Back to Psalm 103. It says, God does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Wow! What a wonderful promise, especially when you do something wrong. Because here it is. here's the thing. It is so easy when you do something wrong to think that the next thing that, you know, the bad things that happen after that really is God punishing you. So maybe you start up your car or you try to start up your car tomorrow and it doesn't start. And like, oh, come on. Oh, that's right. I did that thing that was wrong and God's getting me for that. And so you get to work, but you get to work late. And so your boss is yelling at you for being late to work, and you have a terrible morning. And you're like, oh, yeah, oh, that's right. God's getting back at me for that. And then you're, you go to Taco Bell because, you know, Chipotle's closed for whatever reason. You're going to Taco Bell. <laughs> and you get some tacos, and you get your order from the drive-thru, and you come back, and you pull out your tacos, and you find they forgot to put meat on your tacos. How do you even do that? But you're like, oh, oh, wait, that's right. It's because... I did this wrong. God's getting me. Now, let me be as clear as I can for you. God does not operate that way. God does not punish you because he already punished Jesus on the cross for you. Does that make sense? That's good news. Third reason why this promise, there is now no condemnation, is good news is because it means that God doesn't reject you. Through your baptism and through faith in Christ, you are adopted into God's family, and God is not going to treat you in any way less than his son or daughter. And so remember, there is now no condemnation. And I get it. When you hear that word condemned, you think negative, right? You think rejection. You think giving someone the silent treatment. Or maybe you think uh, turning your back on someone. That's not how God's going to treat you. The one who took your sins on his shoulders is never going to turn a cold shoulder on you. He won't. His arms are open, remember? He does not reject you. Fourth reason why this promise is good news is because it means that God will not keep his blessings from you. 
even though you, by your own sinful actions and decisions, can actually block God's blessings from flowing into your life the way he wants them to come, you can do that. You can stop God's blessings from coming into your life by the way you live. It doesn't mean that God's going to ever stop trying to bless you. Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. God will not keep his blessings from you. Think about a, a large banquet table filled with all of God's blessings. And now imagine you, as his child, you take one of those blessings and you throw it on the floor and you waste it in some way. Now obviously God is going to be grieved by that. But it doesn't mean he's going to say, okay, that's it. Leave my table forever. No. You are his child, right? And because you are his child, he will never stop trying to bless you. He, he just won't. The bottom line is that if you do make a mistake or some bad choice and you find yourself beating yourself up over that bad choice again and again and again, first thing you want to do is hear God's promise, right? Right? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You hear it and believe that it's true for you. Paul goes on in verse 2, and he says this. Through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. So after you hear God's promise, there is now no condemnation. Second, you see God's process. You see and figure out how God makes it possible in order for you to face no condemnation. Now, I don't know if you caught it or not, but in that second verse, Paul identifies two laws. And one law sets you free from the other law. The law from which you are set free, Paul identifies this way. He calls it the law of sin and death. That law, though, is God's holy, perfect, and beautiful law. It's a law that God gave to his people in the Old Testament. But Paul calls it the law of sin and death. First of all, he calls it the law of sin because, well, we're sinners and we are constantly violating God's holy law. But because of that, not just the law of sin, but the law of sin and death. Because, and, and when death, not just, in, and when I, when I say death, don't think death is in like when you get old, you die death. But death is an eternal separation from God in hell because of, uh, as a punishment for your sin, death. Okay, so that kind of death. But that's the law of sin and death, and it will only condemn you. Now, I'm going to look back at verse 2 again, and you'll see a new law that God provides. Look at this. Paul says, the law of the spirit of life sets you free from the law of sin and death. So Paul is saying that God has established a new law, and the new law overwhelms the old law. Pay attention to that. Now, that doesn't mean that the old law of sin and death... It's gone. Like, boop, it's gone. Don't have to worry about it. Nope, nope, nope. It just means that it has been overwhelmed by the new law. Let me explain it this way. I have a pen here, and if I let go of this pen, the law of gravity will take over and pull that pen down to the floor, right? But if I let go and I catch it with my hand, all of a sudden my hand has overwhelmed the law of gravity. The law of gravity still exists, but my hand has overwhelmed that law. In fact, my hand can work against the law of gravity and lift it up above my head. Now, here's where I'm going with this. The Bible says you're a sinner. And because you are a sinner, you were in a spiritual free fall. Okay? You were, but God caught you in his love, and he lifts you up out of your sin. And that's why Paul says in verse 2 that God overwhelms the old law of sin and death with this new law that is at work through the spirit of life, okay, the spirit who is within you. And, and this is important. Paul identifies how important it is by in verse, in, I'm sorry, in chapter 7, the chapter before chapter 8, obviously, Paul mentions the spirit just once because he spends the entire chapter talking about how he, as a human being, tries to bring delight to God on his own. And he, he says, I, I fail miserably. I just can't do it. Actually, Paul says it this way in chapter 7. He says, I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Just can't. Not on my own. In chapter 8, Paul mentions the Holy Spirit 19 times. So as to drive home the truth that the Holy Spirit is, empowers you to do what you cannot do on your own. Right? So it is the Holy Spirit who changes you and empowers you to be this new and better person. How does that happen? Verse 3. 
Paul goes on, he says, for what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son. So if you're beating yourself up over some mistake or some failure, you hear God's promise, you see God's process, but then third, you recognize God's work. You recognize how God overwhelmed that old law of sin and nature with the new law. And God did that in some, some powerful ways. First, God did it by sending his son Jesus to earth. God the Father sent God the Son, second person of the Trinity, to planet earth to save everybody everywhere. Okay? How did he do that? Paul goes on in verse 3 and says that God accomplished that by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man. So second, God sent Jesus to be a human. And that's the amazing miracle that we just celebrated, what, not even a month ago, right, on Christmas. God became one of us in the person of Jesus Christ. Why? Paul goes on in verse 3 and explains, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. So third, God sent Jesus to pay for sin. In the Old Testament, a sin offering was an offering made by the people to say, God, we're sorry for what we did wrong. Paul is saying that Jesus' death on the cross was our sin offering. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus did for you what you could never have done on your own. He paid the punishment for your sin, and that changes everything. How? At the end of verse 3, Paul says this, and so he condemned sin in sinful man. In other words, God sent Jesus to end sin's power over you. So the reason why there is now no condemnation for you, for any of you in Jesus, is because Jesus took your condemnation and put it upon his shoulders on the cross. And when you believe that, condemnation's gone. Paul wraps it up in verse, uh, verse 40. He says, God condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Okay, lots of words. What does that mean? It means that God sent Jesus to fulfill the law. This is huge, folks. Remember the law of sin and death? That's the law that had to be fulfilled. There are still two things that need to be fulfilled. Two demands of the law that Jesus fulfilled in our place. And the first thing that Jesus did was he fulfilled the law or the demand of the law that we perfectly obey what God says in his law. That we live a life of perfect obedience. We can't. It's impossible. So Jesus stepped in as our substitute and did it for us. He lived that life of perfection and holiness for us. So check, Jesus fulfilled that demand of the law for us. But there's a second demand that says that where the law says all sin must be punished. Well, God does not like the idea of us spending all of eternity apart from him in hell. So Jesus stepped in our place and he took the punishment that we deserve for our sins for us on his cross. And it gets better. It gets better. Jesus, yeah, he took our sins, but you know what else he did? He took, as a result of that, he took all of his goodness and his righteousness and his holiness, and he places it upon you. He places it upon you. So what does that mean? It means that when God looks at you now, when you believe that Jesus is your Savior, when God looks at you, guess what he sees? He doesn't see a bunch of sin sinners. He sees a bunch of saints. Sees a bunch of people covered in the righteousness of Christ. What an amazing exchange. Jesus not only takes your sins, your mistakes, and your failures and pays for those mistakes and failures on the cross, but he also lives a, a perfect, holy life so that he could give you his holiness and his perfection. What a deal. What a deal. And this new law is what God, the Holy Spirit, works in our hearts and in our lives so that we no longer have to feel worthless. Why? Because there's no condemnation. It's gone. So when you find yourself beating yourself up over some bad choice or some you know, mistake or failure that in your past, and you've been doing this for a while now, stop, okay? 
You don't have to live that way any longer. When you believe that Jesus is your Savior, and you come to God, and you confess your sin, and you believe that Jesus is your Savior from that sin, you're golden. Okay, you can walk away with a smile on your face. Here's the thing. Pay attention. If you do that, okay, and, and you believe that God forgives you, and he promises that he will, and God is, never breaks a promise. If you, after you've done that, still feel guilty, that guilt is not from God. That guilt is from the enemy, Satan, because he wants you to be miserable. He wants you to keep beating yourself up, because why? You're not a threat anymore. You're not a threat to him. You're not going to be an effective kingdom worker when you're feeling weighed down by guilt. So stop. I'm here to tell you, stop, stop. The first four verses of Romans 8 provide, um, provide this incredible gift that God offers a promise and a process by which he does all the work, and that, in turn, gives you the freedom that you need from your guilt, right? There is now no condemnation, only freedom, only freedom in Christ. Amen? This is amazing. What a, what a, can't wait to find out what the rest of the book, uh, chapter teaches us, right? So let me close uh, by challenging you in a couple of ways. Between now and next Sunday, I want you to read Romans 8. Read the whole chapter. Okay, take some time as you read it. Don't just fly through it. Let the words soak in to your mind and your heart. Second, memorize Romans 8. That's the promise. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Memorize that and those four truths. God's not angry at you. He doesn't punish you. He doesn't reject you. And he will not keep his blessings for, from you, no matter what you do. And then third, exchange condemning statements for God-glorifying statements. Every time you catch yourself saying, I'm no good, replace it with, I am free. I am a saint in Jesus. I am his. Amen? Amen. Yes, let's pray. Let's pray about that. Father in heaven, thank you for this incredible promise that you do not condemn us. Thank you for this great exchange. Lord, help us to see how you worked out that promise through your son, Jesus, that you came not to condemn the world, but to save it. And each and every one of us, thank you for the apostle Paul. Thank you for his letter to the church in Rome, especially this chapter that we're going to be looking at over the next couple of weeks. Father, bless this series and bless us through it. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' great name. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Zardi. The bad news is, is i got to follow that up next week. So uh, thanks a lot for a great message. Uh, but Book of Romans, I mean, eighth chapter, it's golden. It's golden. So much good. We hope to see you back next week and in the weeks to follow. We turn our attention now to worship. And one of the way we, ways we worship is in our giving. So we'll pass the plate and receive gifts and tithes and offerings. Thank you for uh, being generous. If you came prepared to give, those will go on the plate in a moment. If not, there's other ways to give. If you didn't come prepared to give, that's okay. We didn't want you to feel guilty or feel bad about this part of our worship. But God calls those who are walking with him to be generous, and he changes hearts. So we give joyfully and with a great attitude. Uh, the direct translation is we give hilariously. So we almost laugh with joy as we give. So we'll give and we'll sing and worship.
didn't sin. now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We heard that. Uh, and Pastor already did a great job of explaining what that means. But let me reiterate what it means to be in Christ Jesus, right? That's, that's the qualifier. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Faith, believing. This faith that we have in Christ is a gift. It's nothing that you generated. It's nothing that I tried real hard to have. It was given to me. It was given to you. In the preaching of the word, in the reading of the word, when you have God's word in your life, your faith grows. It's given to you. In the words and water of baptism, you were given faith. You were washed clean. The Bible says so. And now in this holy meal, this mystery, this bread and wine, this holy communion, it's more than just a doing of a thing. It's a receiving of a thing. You'll come forward, bread and wine to be sure, but mysteriously in that bread and wine, Christ's body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. You get the goods in this holy meal. You'll come forward and everything that Jesus did for you on the cross is being given to you. You're consuming it. You're taking it inside yourself. So come forward with a joyful heart. You don't do anything to earn this meal. The only thing you bring to this meal is your sinfulness. So come forward as confessing sinners. We already did that. God knows that you understand that you're a sinner and he's glad to give you this banquet this morning for the forgiveness of your sins. The Bible says rejoice in this holy meal. It's good, but take it seriously. Understand what's happening here because the Bible says if you, if you partake of this meal in a way that you don't fully understand, it actually might be detrimental. So we take our time and explain what's going on here. And at this time, let me invite the uh, worship assistants forward to take your places at your stations. Uh, the way we do that is to uh, uh, ask ourselves five questions. So now we ask ourselves these five questions. Have I been baptized in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Secondly, do I believe that I'm a sinful human being without hope of eternal life, without God's mercy and the grace of Christ Jesus? Thirdly, do I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He is my personal Savior? Number four, do I believe that Christ is personally present in the bread and wine with His body and blood? And finally, do I commit by the power of the Holy Spirit to get, live a godly life? If you answer yes to these five questions, this meal is for you this morning. And we remember how it all started. Words from the Bible. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, after the meal, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is a New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. 
This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters, this is good stuff. Come forward and receive Christ this morning. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child.
child of God. Now may the eating of this true body and drinking of this true blood strengthen and preserve you now and forever. Go and rejoice, my brothers and sisters. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's come together in prayer. Lord, we rejoice in the truths of Romans 8.1. There is now no condona- condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you for this washing truth that you did it all and we are set free. We lift up brothers and sisters who are wrestling with their health. Lord, we pray for T.C. Biggs and Carrie Deal, Jerry Elgin, Rosemary Freitag, Dennis Goodhart Sr., Kathy Hackney, Jean Meisner, Chad Morrison, Kate Olaszewski, Kristen Pansky, Larry Saunders, Paula Schrumpf, for George Sedlak, Patty Stewart, Pastor John Sugatan, Bill Teske, Sherry Whippenbeck, and Mark Woodward. Lord, would you grant them healing if it's your will? Be with them. Remind them of your promise to never leave them. Bless their families and friends who are concerned about them. Let their faith remain strong during this difficult time. We rejoice, Lord, in the baptism of Colton John DeLuca. New life through the water and the word. Bless this young man and his parents, Samuel and Elm. Lord, we share in the promise of the resurrection with the families of Raymond Klon and Beverly Hawkins, who passed away this week. Comfort those who mourn, Lord. Remind them that, Jesus, you have overcome death. We pray for peace in the world, Lord. We pray for the conflicts that we're aware of, the one in Israel, the one in the Ukraine, the ones we don't know about. Would you end war? Would you end violence? That this might be a planet of peace where your rule um, is, in, uh, is sovereign. We pray for our nation, Lord. We seem so divided. We seem so angry at each other. Let us be united in love and peace, willingness to hear the other side and at least have conversations. Bless our leaders, those who have been appointed, those who have been elected, that they might govern with righteousness and goodness, fairness and decency. Lord, we conclude our prayer this morning as we boldly pray this prayer that Jesus taught us. And together we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thanks for coming to church today. I hope you are blessed. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Yeah.
shadow Your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now For I am safe with you So when I fight I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet I'll see through the night For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. stand against the power of our God and all my fortress you go before us nothing can stand 